good morning everybody looks like we got everything working here go ahead and turn your Bibles if you would to Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24 and <clears throat> this is uh, part two of the four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse and I'll be live streaming on YouTube Facebook and sermon audio and the sermon archive of these lessons is currently on YouTube for as long as I can keep them there and they're also going to be backed up on sermonaudio.com and I also air these Bible studies every Friday on Final Fight Bible Radio at 8 o'clock a.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific time and if you enjoy this content I encourage you to share it with your friends and family and just as a quick update or quick announcement I'm going to be out of town next weekend so there won't be a Bible study next weekend uh, so part three will be in two weeks just so you know so if you want you can take advantage of the opportunity to catch up on one of the previous lessons that perhaps you've missed I encourage uh, watching the lessons on the signs of the beast those are always good to review some of this material and also more of some of the things going on right now but anyway this is part two of these lessons that I'm calling the four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse and it's a bit tongue-in-cheek I understand that but I do have a reason for calling it this and before I can explain what the four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse are I had to first help you to or help help you to understand what the actual four horsemen of the apocalypse are and when they appear on the timeline and as you recall from last week the four horsemen of the apocalypse the four biblical actual <laughs> horsemen of the apocalypse are given in Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 and they compose the first four sealed judgments of the end times and all of the sealed judgments, it's, it's important that you understand that all of the sealed judgments, all of the trumpet judgments, and all of the vile judgments that you read about in the book of Revelation are all post-rapture. Okay, All of those things happen after the rapture of the church, which means the rapture of the church happens before any of those cataclysms pr prophesied in the book of Revelation happen okay so the rapture happens before any of those things and the church and the body of Christ is not present for any of those things because the church at that time will be in heaven and not on the earth and when I say the word church I'm not referring to the independent Baptist church I'm not referring to any particular denomination uh, when I say church I'm referring to the biblical usage of the word which is the corporate whole of all the believers in Jesus Christ every single Christian that's ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior is born again and is part of the church and is part of the bride of Christ you don't have to be a member of any particular Baptist Church to be a part of the bride uh, you're placed into the body you're part of the bride you're part of the church when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior at that moment all right so when I use the word church just bear in mind that I'm referring to anybody at this time who is born again all right and ever basically every Christian since uh, the crucifixion up until the rapture of the church if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ you're part of that body of Christ all right and at the rapture that's when Jesus is gonna come back in the clouds and he's gonna there's gonna be the sound of the trumpet we went over that and the dead in Christ are gonna rise first and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord praise God all right so the church is going to be in heaven, not on the earth, for all of these events. So the rapture occurs, and then the four horsemen go forth. And as a brief recap, you'll remember that the white horse uh, we identified last week as the man of sin, or the Antichrist, the man of sin uh, specifically. And the rider of the white horse corresponds to the start of the beginning of sorrows. All right. And if you don't remember some of that information, you can go back and watch the last lesson I did last week. All right. The red horse is a world war that occurs there's a great sword and peace is taken from the earth and there's a world war evidently that's going to take place um, short within a few years after the rapture of the church and then uh, that's not to say there can't be a world war before then you know we've had two world wars in the church age we could always have a third <laughs> and it's not looking good these days so this could either be world war three you could have world war one world war two world war three or you could have world war one world war two world war three 
World War IV. Regardless of what number it is, it's a world war. All right. And then you have the black horse, and that is economic disaster, famine, things like that that the Bible talks about. And then uh, finally, we have the pale horse. And again, the pale horse is identified as the Antichrist, except specifically the pale horse is the son of perdition. And the writing of the pale horse corresponds to the start of the Great Tribulation. All right, so you'll remember you have Antichrist, man of sin, Antichrist, son of perdition. This is the man of sin comes through here, and then he apparently is, receives a mortal wound, a death blow, and then he's risen from the dead as a counterfeit of Jesus Christ, and at that time, he is the son of perdition. Same man, except this time, it is Satan manifest in the flesh. This man is a man of sin, undoubtedly demon-possessed, but this is actually Satan manifest in the flesh. All right, And so the white horse, if you will, dies and comes back as... A pale zombie horse, evidently. So, you know, there's a reason why this horse isn't a rainbow horse. <laughs> there's a reason why it's pale. Why is it pale? Because that's what the white horse risen from the dead. It's a pale horse, all right? So you got uh, white horse, red horse, black horse, pale horse. The white horse corresponds to the Antichrist beginning of sorrows. Pale horse corresponds to the Antichrist start of the Great Tribulation. All right, and then, uh, interestingly enough, we find this same pattern laid out in Matthew chapter 24. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open your Bible right now to Matthew chapter 24. And last week I went over what the four horsemen were and I kind of gave some general idea as to where they show up on the, this timeline. But I'm going to validate that through Matthew chapter 24 and show you some things from that chapter that are going to be very important to this study and are going to be very important to understanding where the four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse come in. All right, so Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, and we'll start reading here in verse 3. The Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? All right, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. All right. So then what we have here in verse 5, he says this, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, that's Antichrist, I am Christ, claiming to be Christ, that anti can mean against Christ, or Antichrist can mean instead of Christ. Okay. So if you have someone coming along saying, I am Christ, and denying the, uh, the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that's that spirit of Antichrist. All right. So... Here you have the white horse. Jesus is going to give some uh, circumstances that are going to happen. And the first thing he says is, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. All right, so let me get my marker here. Essentially what we have here is Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. Okay? That's the white horse. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now look at verse 6. What follows the white? What follows this this antichrist? What follows this counterfeit of Christ? Verse six. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. All right. So wars. How about that? Wars. That sounds like a maybe a red horse to me. All right. Now he says the end is not yet. So this is going to be a bad war. The Bible describes it as having a great sword and peace being taken from the earth. And if, if a person was alive at this time and had a Bible and was kind of understanding what was going on, that would certainly seem like this has got to be it. This is the end of the world. Because, I mean, you think about the nuclear weapons and the space age technologies that the nations of the world have, and them getting in a world war, it's not going to be good. And it's going to seem like the end of the world, probably, but Jesus says, hey, if you're here, not talking to you as a born-again Christian, but the reader at this time in history, he says, the end is not yet, unfortunately. <laughs> There's still some more, it's going to get much worse. And the end is essentially the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, all right? And I don't have a lot of time to go into this concept right here. But when he says the end, he's not referring there to the second advent. He's referring to the final uh, half of a week of Daniel's 70 weeks, right? So 
since uh, the return of the Jews from captivity, the the seventy or the the restoring of the temple and the building of Jerusalem, seventy weeks were determined upon the Jewish people. Sixty nine and a half weeks of those weeks have already been fulfilled. You're at the end when you have the great tribulation. So the end is not a singular event per se. Uh, the end here is referring to this whole final three and a half years. And Jesus says the end is not yet. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time to go into that detail, but it's one of those things you should keep in the back of your mind. The end is not like the last final seconds of the Great Tribulation period in that context. It's the final three and a half years, all right? So anyway, he says then in verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And he says, And there shall be, oh, look at that, famines. Well, that's Revelation chapter 6. Famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Now look at what he says in verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Remember he had just said, the end is not yet. None of this craziness is the end. All of this is something else. It's the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning. This is the end. Okay, you see that? So you've got to get those two things separated there. And all these things, uh, the, you know, the people running around saying that they're Christ, you know, uh, the wars, the famines, all of those things are the beginning of sorrows. Now, pay attention in the passage. We do not have, we, we have not read about hell showing up in the passage, right? We haven't, we haven't seen that. There's no pale horse yet, because you remember that the pale horse is death and hell. Right? And hell followed with him, and the rider on the white horse is death, and we looked at Abaddon and Apollyon and Son of Perdition and all that stuff. We haven't read about any of that yet in what Jesus has said. Okay. Now, the time period that Jesus is describing meets all the criteria of the first three horsemen, but this is not yet the end. It is not the Great Tribulation period. And by the way, none of this is a part of the church age either. Okay, the church age is back here and ends with the rapture of the church. Look at what he says in verse 9. Jesus says, And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. All right, these are Jesus' followers. And they'll kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, this will be a time of persecution for those who follow Jesus and a time of love waxing cold and all that, which really is not extremely remarkable or extremely incredible. I mean, persecution has gone on for the last 2,000 years, right? I mean, the church, as somebody pointed out in the comments section last week, uh, the church has been going through tribulation. Uh, since the days of Calvary, I mean, right at, I mean, at the very beginning, uh, Paul went through tribulations, right? But that, but the the tribulation that the church goes through, and John being our brother and companion in tribulation, that's not the same as what Jesus is describing here in Matthew chapter twenty-four. Granted, the word is the same, but you have to look at the context and, and pay attention. Otherwise, the Great Tribulation has been going on for the last 2,000 years, right? And it's not to undermine or, or negate or, or, or minimize the trouble that the body of Christ has gone through. I mean, f for the Dark Ages, I mean, Christians were burned at the stake and had all kinds of horrific things that happened to them. But not, And that was great tribulation, you might say. That was great trouble. But it wasn't this great tribulation. You, you see the difference? This, is, this describes more like a time period, whereas all of that describes circumstances that happen to them. So what I'm trying to get at is the church has gone through tribulation for, yeah, for every believer in God has always experienced some tribulation. Jesus said, in the world you shall have trouble. <laughs> right? So you're not going to get away from it no matter what. But the great tribulation is something else, and that describes the end of Daniel's 70th week. So you want to make sure to get those things separated a little bit there. But uh, look at what he says here. There's going to be persecution of his people. And the clue that tells you that we're reading about a, a, reading about a time that is after the church age. All right? So, you know, you're going through, you're reading Matthew 24, verses 9 through 12 here, and you're thinking, oh, well, that sounds a lot like the church age. There's people in China being persecuted, and they're being hated of all nations for Jesus' name's sake. So, these things must be being fulfilled right now. Incorrect. That's not right. 
In this particular context, it's referring to this time period, the beginning of sorrows, okay? And you know that because of what Jesus says here in verse 13. Look at verse 13. But he that shall believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Is that what that says? Is that what that verse says? No. <laughs> the verse says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now listen, that is that message right there, He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved, that's a straight up heresy. In the, in the day that we're living in right now. Not only, yeah, that's heresy. Not, not just false teaching, but heresy. <laughs> All right? <laughs> you say, Jesus was preaching heresy? Not, in, not at the time that he was preaching it. This is pre-Calvary. Okay? There, there's a big change that happened after Calvary. Okay? And there's going to be a big change that happens after the rapture of the church. Okay? Now, we're, I'm going to get into this a little bit. You've got to understand this. If I was passing out tracts, and I went up to somebody, and, you know, and somebody came up to me, and they said, how do I get saved? How do I get saved? And then I told them that they had to, what you have to do, friend, is endure unto the end, and then you'll be saved. All right? Well, I would be teaching salvation by works. Right? If I told someone, you have to endure unto the end. That's works-based salvation. Uh, that would be a false gospel that I would be teaching that person. And I would be accursed according to Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Right? Alright, well, let me just read Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 for you, in case you're not familiar with what that verse says. This is what Paul said. He said, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul never preached to the Galatians, you must endure unto the end to be saved. Paul never preached that. And Paul says, if anybody preaches any other gospel than what we're preaching unto you, let him be accursed. What did Paul preach to the Galatians? He preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that salvation is a free gift received by grace. It's, it's a free gift by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. All right? And he says in verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, you say, well, why does Paul and Jesus preach different gospels? Well, who did Paul get his, his message from? Who did he, he receive his revelation from? He received it from Jesus. All right, right? So the, the bigger question is, why is Jesus preaching one thing here and something different? He tells Paul to preach something different later on. What you're getting into is this, what people call dispensations, right? It's rightly dividing the word of truth. Like I've said before, I don't like the term dispensations. I think it's a misnomer. But if you want to call it something, biblically, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right. So it gets worse. Uh, look at Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. All right. So he talks about the gospel of the kingdom being preached. The gospel of the kingdom here is not the gospel of the grace of God that we preach today. You say, what are you getting at, Brother Crane? What I'm getting at is everything that Jesus is describing here in uh, Matthew 24, verses 3 through 14, is cannot possibly be the church age. There are some things that are sort of similar, but nothing he has said here can possibly be the church age. All right? Because you have a completely different gospel being preached. And this is all still future. All right? So this gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of the grace of God. We preach Paul's gospel, and this is not Paul's gospel. This is the gospel that was preached during the ministry of Jesus by the apostles, and it's also known as the gospel of the kingdom of heaven in the Bible. And Paul did not preach this gospel. The gospel of <clears throat> the gospel of the kingdom, okay, that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 24, has to do with a person preparing themselves for the literal, physical arrival of a literal, physical king who is going to have a literal, physical kingdom on the earth. That's the gospel of the kingdom, or the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, as sometimes it's referred to. The good news of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven 
and uh, was preached in Jesus' day. And it was preached and it was at hand in Jesus' day because the King of Heaven was present at that time and was prepared to establish the kingdom in Jerusalem if the Jews were willing to receive it. All right, That's why that message was preached at that time. The Jews didn't receive it, and so the physical kingdom concept... Okay, this is a... Uh, let's use a different marker here. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. And it's to Israel, specifically. Alright? The Jews rejected this gospel, this good news, this message that the, Jesus and the apostles were preaching. And so this message essentially got set on the shelf for the time being. And Jesus showed up to Paul and he says, I want you to preach and take my gospel to the Gentiles. Now that was a very different thing, right? That was a very different thing compared to what had happened before. Because you remember when Jesus uh, was... Uh, interacting with some of the Gentiles, and that woman was asking uh, Jesus to heal her daughter, he says, sorry, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, something, something's changing, not, not here, <laughs> something's changing back at Calvary. Okay? And essentially what has happened is God has switched his attention to a, once the Jews rejected the, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God began to be preached, Right, and that was a spiritual kingdom, and that was aimed at uh, basically the church, and the church is primarily made up of Gentiles, way more Gentiles than Jews in the church. All right, so you see God's shifting of His attention there after Calvary, because the Jews rejected Jesus, they rejected their King, and they crucified Him. So the Lord says, "Fine, we'll go to the Gentiles, we'll, and they'll receive me." Right, all right, so. God's attention has shifted from Israel, his physical people, to the church, his spiritual people. And right now, there are three people groups in the world as far as God is concerned, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there are three people groups as far as God is concerned. That's church, Jew, and Gentile. Right? Okay? There's the church. These are saved people. And in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. It has nothing to do with your race, your sex, your class, none of that. We're all one in Christ in the church at this time. Outside of Christ, for unsaved people, there's Gentile and Jew. Okay? Now, after the rapture, once the church is raptured out, okay, and the church is out of the picture, what do you have left? You have Gentile and Jew. You have Jew and Gentile here. No church, because the church has been taken out. All right, So you're left with two people groups, and at this time, God will once again shift his attention back towards Israel, and he will resume his mission to restore the nation of Israel to himself so that he can fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, He made some promises, and he has to keep those promises. And there are some spiritual aspects of those promises that can be applied to us, as Paul points out in the book of Romans, but there are some physical land promises and physical seed and offspring promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God is going to keep it, right? So at this time, once the church is out, you're left with Jew and Gentile, and who is God going to focus his attention on? The Jew. And then you get into the 144,000, right, showing up in here, and they are God's witnesses, and there are essentially 144,000 apostles going around preaching to the nation of Israel. All right? Primarily. Okay, so after the rapture, bear in mind, once the rapture happens, and hopefully it'll be in the next few years, after the rapture happens, there is only 10 years to the coming of the king. They are within 10 years of the kingdom of heaven being brought down upon the earth and Jerusalem finally having the kingdom that God had always, always promised. They're within 10 years of that thing. Or 7 years if you want to make it that. But anyway, it's very, very close. And the king of heaven will be returning within 10 years. The kingdom of heaven will be established in Jerusalem within 10 years. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven at this time will again be at hand. It's coming. It's going to be soon. It's within a decade. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is going to be preached. Remember? Because this is a physical gospel. 
You and me, we're not looking for some kingdom to come down so that we can rule and reign per se. We're, we're in a spiritual kingdom. We're waiting for Jesus to blow the trumpet so that we can be taken up to heaven, right? At this, So we're preaching the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, a spiritual gospel. The Bible says the gospel of the kingdom of God is not, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not physical, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual gospel. But once the church is out, once the church is out, you go back to this kingdom of heaven set up like you had originally. Okay? Like you had originally in the days of Jesus. Kingdom of heaven being preached. All right? So, that catches us up with the passage. All right, verse 14. And then this, uh, gospel, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So, Jesus wants the gospel of the kingdom to be preached in all the world unto all nations for a witness. And there's got to be enough time for that to happen. And, <clears throat> and then he says, and then shall the end come. The end like the second advent? No. Verse 15. Here's the end. When ye shall see the abomination spoken of by uh, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. In those days, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of this world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Alright, so the great tribulation basically starts in verse 15. This is when the end begins. Now the end begins. <laughs> not, not back there. That's a, that's a good website. It's got a lot of good stuff on there. But technically the end begins right here. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, it's alright. Uh, the great, if the great tribulation starts in verse 15, okay, and then Jesus describes, you know, the tribulation and, and all the things that are going to be happening uh, through, uh, let's see, uh, he talks about in verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, second advent. So essentially you have verse 15 through 29, if you will, here, and verse 3 through 14 here, all right? So if verse 15 is the start of the Great Tribulation, and verses 3 through 14 are before the Great Tribulation, but verses 3 through 14 are not the church age, as I explained, okay? Then that can only mean one thing. That means there has to be a gap between the rapture and the start of the Great Tribulation. There has to be a gap. And I call this gap the beginning of sorrows. You know, that's just a title I took from what Jesus said here. And I teach that it's seven years long. Now, some people say that this time period is three and a half years long, and this one's three and a half years long. Whatever. I, I'm fully convinced that this whole time period is ten and a half years. And this gives you three and a half year great tribulation and seven years of beginning of sorrows. But, there, but what I'm getting at is there has to be enough time between the rapture of the church and the start of the great tribulation for these things of verses 3 through 14 to happen. And essentially what that means is the theory that it's rapture three and a half years second advent, that can't work. There's no possible way that can work. And that also means this, because remember, the great tribulation starts when the Antichrist stands in the holy place, right? Well, if that's true, which the Bible says it is, then that means that the church will not see that happen. If the church saw the Antichrist stand in the holy place and then got raptured, like some people teach out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, then you would have to take this whole time period and throw it out. You would have Antichrist standing in the holy place, rapture, and then three and a half years. But that won't work, because you have to fit verses 3 through 14 in there somewhere. You have to have the 144,000 preaching. You have to have this gospel of the kingdom being preached unto all nations. You have to have some time there for these events to happen. You have to have some time for the white horse, the red horse, and the black horse. You can't just have rapture, pale horse, three and a half years. It won't work. So that theory won't work. Now... One three and a half year theory allows for maybe four months and then rapture four months and then great tribulation. But I, I personally still don't think four months is enough time for the for all of these things to take place. All right. So 
I teach it seven years, three and a half years, and then so on and so forth, all right? But I say that because there's a lot of Christians that are under the impression that they're, they can't be raptured until they see the Antichrist stand in the holy place. Well, you know, newsflash, there is no holy place right now. There's no temple in Jerusalem, all right? So a lot of Christians are waiting for the temple to be built. And then they figure, oh, the temple will be built, and then the Antichrist will stand in there, and then we'll get raptured. No, that's not how it happens. We're not around for any of that. When we go, that's still a number of years away. I mean, we could be raptured, and there might not even be a temple in Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem could be built after we're raptured. So those are some of the things to think about. Now, I know these are kind of tedious details, but it's important that you understand that you are not going to be here as a born-again Christian for any of the four horsemen. Not one of them. All right, You're going to be up. You're going to be gone before that happens. So the order of events is uh, rapture, beginning of sorrows, great tribulation, second advent, and then millennium after that. The beginning of sorrows is the white horse, red horse, black horse. The great tribulation is the pale horse, and that's the coming of the king of hell and the kingdom of hell on the earth. And then you have the coming of the king of heaven and the kingdom of heaven on the earth with second advent. All right, so like I said, the point I'm trying to make with all this is that the four horsemen of Revelation 6 match the prophecies of Matthew 24, verses 1 through 15. It's a perfect match. Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 are a perfect match. Okay? And the church has nothing to do with the horsemen of Revelation 6, and the church has nothing to do with the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24. All right, now, it's important that you understand that, and here's why. Look at Matthew 24, verse 6 and 8, one more time, 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. All right? Now, Christians often read this passage here in Matthew 24. I don't know how many times I've heard it taught and preached this way on the radio, in person, in church, and this and that. So many times you hear this passage preached, and Christians say, well, all of these disasters are happening right now. We're seeing wars and rumors of wars, and we're seeing famines and pestilences. We are living in the days of Matthew 24, verses uh, 6 through 8. You know, we're seeing all these things being fulfilled right before our eyes. And so Christians naturally think, well, we must be in the beginning of sorrows. We're toward the end of the church age, and so the beginning of sorrows is happening, and the great tribulation is coming. All right? That's, that's a lot of times how this is preached. They see, oh, well, these earthquakes, you know, are happening, the famines are happening, the pestilences are happening, so therefore, we must be in this time period. Wrong. <laughs> we are not in this time period. These things have been happening for the last 2,000 years, off and on, in different places of the world, right? Just because they're happening in our lifetime doesn't mean that we're in this time period. History has not caught up with Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 14. We're not there yet. The world is still a little ways from that. And the, event, and the events of Matthew 24, verses 3 through 14, or verses 6 through 8 right here, the wars and the famines and the pestilences, all of those things involve the first three horsemen of the apocalypse, and the church will be up in heaven before those first three horsemen go forth. So it's important to understand that doctrinal technicality. But let's get into this. What about the wars and the famines and the pestilences and the earthquakes that we are seeing in these days? And certainly there is an uptick in these things. We're seeing more and more of these things at a rapid uh, increasing frequency. So what about that? Well... What we're seeing, and here's really the crux of what I'm getting into with these lessons. What we're seeing is a prelude to the real thing. Okay, We are witnessing a dress rehearsal, if you will. And the events that we are seeing are very similar to the real thing. That's why I call it a dress rehearsal. What we are seeing, we are certainly seeing wars and famines and rumors of wars. I mean, there's rumors of wars with Russia and Ukraine and the United States right now. Right? We're seeing all of that right now. But these are just a dress rehearsal, if you will, of what the real thing is. Okay? And the things that we're seeing today are so similar to the things described 
in prophecy in the Bible that some Christians are getting very confused. And what we're seeing is similar to the real thing, but it is not the real thing. The church will never see the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but we are evidently seeing maybe four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse. In other words, we're seeing something that's very similar, but what we are seeing in our lifetime right now is not the fulfillment of these actual prophecies here in the scripture. As bad as things are in the world right now, what we are seeing and what we are experiencing right now and the famines and the earthquakes and the wars and the tsunamis and all the pestilences, you know, what we are experiencing in our lifetime right now is nothing compared to what's coming. Okay? The wars and rumors of war that we're seeing and hearing about right now are just a cute little red Shetland pony in com and, is com and is tiny in comparison to the actual red horse that's going to be coming in the future. All right? Now, I do believe that we're in the last days of the church age. I do believe that uh, the Laodicean church is the last of the seven churches and best describes the condition of the body of Christ as a whole uh, in these days. I do believe that, personally, that the rapture will be in my lifetime, and I do believe that the rapture will be soon. But I'm not convinced that the rapture is going to be today. And I'm not convinced that it will be tomorrow. And I'm not convinced that the rapture is even going to be next year, this year or next year. And honestly, I'm not convinced that the rapture is going to be the year after that. And I'm okay if it is. I mean, I will be pleasantly surprised if I'm wrong. Okay, But in my opinion, I think we still have a number of years left to go. Maybe even five, six, seven years. I think we have a number of years left to go, in my opinion. And I have a number of reasons why I think that. But one of the reasons I think that is because I recognize that God does things in patterns, as I showed you in the Three Great Days of Prophecy series. You can go back and watch that if you haven't seen it yet. But God continually does things in patterns throughout the scripture. And we are certainly seeing wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences and so on. And we're in a time that at least seems to maybe be patterned after the tribulation. Uh, so much so that there's a lot of Christians that actually think we're in the tribulation right now. Because of some of the things that we've seen in the last two to three years. And what we're seeing in the world right now, what we're seeing in Australia, what we're seeing in New Zealand, what we're seeing in you know, places like Canada and China and some of these places and some of this crazy stuff that's going on in the world, people think, well, we're in the tribulation right now. You know, and these crazy uh, things that are being uh, poked into you, right? <laughs> some people think we're in the tribulation right now. Well, if I'm correct, that what we're seeing right now is indeed a deliberate pattern that's manifesting before our eyes, then it stands to reason that the pattern is going to continue. As anyone knows, if you do a final dress rehearsal before a play, you don't reenact only half of the production, right? You reenact the whole thing from start to finish. Well, the real end time production, if you want to call it that, has multiple acts has multiple acts. Act 1, let me get a black marker here. Act 1 of the real end time production. Act 1 is essentially the beginning of sorrows. Act 2 is, uh, let's make sure I get this right, and the beginning of sorrows is horsemen number 1 through 3 when they take the stage. Act 2 is the great tribulation and that's when the fourth horseman takes the stage. Say one through three. All right. And then act three is the last act. And that's the return of the king. And the establishment of his kingdom. All right. So let me get a little bit of space here. Or, let me do this. So from here all the way to here, 
is essentially act one. All right, from here to here, if you will, is act two. And then here onward is act three. I'm just kind of putting it in terms of a production. We'll just, we'll just put it that way. Act one, first three horses. Act two, the fourth horse in the Great Tribulation. Act three is the second advent and the, and the establishment of the kingdom of, uh, the glorious kingdom on the earth, all right? If we are, so here's what I'm getting at. If we are indeed living in a final dress rehearsal, and this is just a speculation, this is just a theory, but it seems to fit pretty good because like I said, God does things in patterns. And if, we are, if the world is going to see a dress rehearsal before that time, then the dress rehearsal is going to be very similar, but it's not the same thing. And if we are living in the final dress rehearsal, then I suspect that we are going to see the full dress rehearsal of the, of the entire production before it happens. And we would see something that looks very similar to Act 1, and we would see something very similar to Act 2, and we would see something very similar to Act 3, the full dress rehearsal before the real production. And if I had to guess, I think we're somewhere in Act 1 right now, maybe at the very start of Act 2 in the year 2022. Okay. What that means, if I'm right, if God is indeed laying out a pattern, and I could be wrong, okay? This could be completely not true. But if it is true, and if I am right, and it looks like we are seeing a pattern, some things that are happening today are very, very similar to what we read about in the end times, but we are not in the end times. So if we're seeing this dress rehearsal, and we're in the first few minutes of Act 2, let's say, then that means we still have a whole act to go before the rapture. The pattern isn't finished yet. We might be getting close to it being finished, but uh, we then again might not be. We might just be wrapping up Act 1 or just getting started with Act 2. And if that's correct, and if the pattern holds, then it's very possible that we could be in for a lot of trouble, at least for a few more years while Act 2, dress rehearsal, plays itself out. But then the dress rehearsal of Act 3 would happen, which honestly would be a welcome reprieve <laughs> to all the craziness that happened in the dress rehearsal of Act 1 and Act 2. And after Act 3 has played out for a few years, then the church will be raptured, and then the real production will go live. Now, as I said, this is just my opinion, and maybe I could be wrong about this. Maybe there isn't a pattern. Maybe there are just a few similarities, but there's no reenactment intended by God. Maybe. But then again, what if I'm right? That's a scenario that's worth considering. And there does seem to be a number of things that point in that direction. And if I'm right, and if we're experiencing similarities to these three acts okay if I'm right then the misinterpretation of prophecy that's already happening right now and the confusion of Christians that's already happening right now is only going to intensify in the coming years as we start to see things that look even crazier and then things that start looking like act chapter 3 <laughs> now Next week, I'm going to get it. well, not next week, but the following week, since I won't be here next week. In two weeks, I'm going to get into the details of this pattern and the four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse. And I'm going to start looking at the things that, are hap that have happened in the last few years, the, the great significant global events that I'm sure you know all about, you've read in the headlines of the news. I'm going to start looking at the things that have happened, uh, the things that are happening now, and based on the pattern the things that I think could happen in the next few years leading up to the rapture. And I'm going to lay out a scenario that if true, or maybe if it's close to being true, could actually explain a lot of the scriptures that pertain to the last days of the church age. 
and I don't want to give away. I, there's a part of me I want to continue to tell you about that because it is really interesting, but I'm going to save that for the next lesson. So I think I've given you enough to think about for today, maybe for the next couple weeks. Think about these things, pray about these things, keep it in the back of your mind. You don't have to believe me, but uh, tune in next or two weeks for part three, and I'll explain. I promise I will explain the four Shetland ponies of the apocalypse. God bless you and have a good week.